Hello everyone and welcome to Starts the 62nd Retirement Income Masterclass of 2021. I'm Rebecca Wilson, your host today and the founder and CEO of Starts at 60, the online home of the Aussie baby boomer. Here at Starts at 60, we're dedicated to bringing over 60s the latest money, health, property, lifestyle and entertainment news, marketplace essentials and great travel deals and discounts for members. If you haven't already checked out our website, you can do so by visiting startsat60.com. For those of you who watched our first Retirement Income Masterclass earlier in the year, how much you really need to retire comfortably, we discussed the costs that need to be considered in retirement, working out the budgets and evaluated the options for funding retirement income, including how your home could play a vital role. If you missed your first masterclass, uh, the first masterclass, don't panic. You can still watch it for free on our website. Just search for how much you really need to retire on startsat60.com where you can find a video of the recording or, add, or comment on Facebook and our team will pop a link into that for you today if you're out there on Facebook. For today's masterclass, we're here with our partner, Household Capital, an award-winning and innovative retirement funding provider. And with the help of our exceptional board of panellists here today, we're going to answer to the biggest question about how to use your home equity to fund your retirement. Um, it's, it's, um, we'll have 50 minutes of discussion with our panel today, then about 10 minutes to answer your questions. And sometimes if you all get involved, we run a little bit over an hour if we've got the complex topic like retirement income. So we've got this wonderful panelist team here with us today and I'm gonna take advantage of it for as long as you guys keep asking questions. Um, you can talk to other community members through the chat function at the bottom of your screen, but please submit your questions for our panelists through the Q&A function. We'll get through as many as we can before our time's up. Before we jump into it, I'd like to say an enormous thank you to Household Capital for being our Masterclass sponsor. We really are thrilled to be working with you again um, and, and love the product that you offer, the over 60 market. Now let's meet our panelists. First up, and you'll probably recognize him from previous webinars and his appearances on television and his books over many decades. It's the fabulous Noel Whitaker. Noel's columns appear every week in most, Australia's, most of Australia's newspapers and he's written 24 books. He's a chartered accountant, an adjunct professor with the Faculty of Business of the University of Queensland and QUT uh, and, and what do they call you, the Wizard of Oz? Um, in so. financial services as well. So just phenomenal <laughs> to have you with us today, Noel. Great to be uh, here. This is Noel's latest book, Retirement Made Simple. Um, it, it has been 30,000 copies already. 30,000. Uh, bestseller list in financial books in Australia. Um, but you'll also remember him for his very early book. The one I, I first read was Making Money Made Simple, which I think is just phenomenal. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Noel. Um, and... So next, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Deborah Ralston. Wait, wait Hi, everybody. Yeah. Um, Deborah is one of the authors of the Government's Retirement Income Review, professorial fellow at Monash University, a key Australian thought leader in financial advice, retirement funding, superannuation, and mortgage broking. Committed to creating a better lifestyle for Australia's retirees, Deborah has recently joined as chair of the advisory board of Household Capital as well. Welcome, Deborah. Finally, we have Fiona Navarro joining us. Fiona has spent over 25 Hi, years in the financial sector. Thank you, Fiona. Um, Specialising in wealth management and insurance and now as a retirement specialist at Household Capital. Household Capital is a specialist retirement funding provider. Through its household loan, it provides responsible long-term access to home equity to help retired Australians live at home well. Fiona's experience in retirement finance, um, along with being passionate advocate of the advice industry, best places her to be a part of the team building new socially responsible lending. And that's really important um, as this world shifts and people need to fund their own retirement. Um, so thank you for joining us, Fiona. We've got a series of questions 
for you today um, as a panel. And we're really just starting the conversations that the community has asked for advice and guidance on. So I'm looking forward um, to sort of firing them off and then seeing where our conversations go. Um, thank you. And let's get straight into it. the conversations that the community has asked for advice and guidance on. So I'm looking forward um, to sort of firing them off and then seeing where our conversations go. Um, thank you. And let's get straight into it. My first question is for Deborah today. Um, the recent retirement income review talked about three ways Australians can expect to plan their retirement income in an ageing society. Deborah, you were one of the authors of this groundbreaking report that the Australian government is now leaning on to build future retirement funding frameworks. Can you take us through the three pillar framework? Sure, yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Um, we, what we were commissioned to do was really to examine the Australian retirement income system and primarily to focus on the three key pillars. That is the age pension, compulsory superannuation, and thirdly, private savings or voluntary savings. And within that area of voluntary savings, we're talking about voluntary superannuation, various forms of private investment, and of course, the home, the family home. So we delivered our report to the Treasurer and it was released in November last year. And our main conclusion was that the Australian retirement income system is effective, it's sound, and its costs are broadly sustainable. However, the system itself is very complex and really not well understood. So as Rebecca said, the part we're talking about today is the third pillar, and in particular, the family home. And I'm just going to quote to you a couple of things that were came out of the report with respect to this part of the system. And that is that it states in the report, the family home is the most important component of primary savings. For most households, 65 and over, the family home is their main asset. Homeowners can access equity in their home to supplement retirement income and provide um, longevity risk. If this potential were realised, housing would take an even more important role in the retirement income system. And that's really what we're talking about today because while we kind of recognise that many people store wealth in their homes, that makes really good sense. The home is not taxed, it's not part of the assets test for the age pension. We often tend not to recognise that it is in fact a major store of wealth. And if you want to live well in retirement, that is one of the most immediate sources. And particularly for older Australians who haven't had the benefit of compulsory superannuation throughout their working lives. This is really a very important part of what is your wealth. However, there are a couple of reasons why people not, tend not to think of this as being a potential income stream. And firstly, when people save for retirement, they think about their nest egg. And we have that attitude that we create a nest egg and we live on the interest from it, but we don't touch the capital. And in fact, that's one of the issues because it is really that capital that you've built up over time. It's not just the interest, but it's a sensible and, and careful drawdown of that particular asset to assist with your standard of living and retirement. And the second reason people tend not to uh, use their retirement savings well is that they have a great fear of running out of money and being unable to afford costs later in life costs such as health and aged care. One of the things that we took a great deal of time to detail in the report is that um, these costs are largely covered by government. And in fact, expenditure throughout retirement continues to go down. It doesn't kick up in the end as many people seem to think. And we're very fortunate. And in fact, that's the fourth pillar of the retirement system health, aged care, tax benefits, and all sorts of concessions. So that uh, is another reason why um, it makes really good sense to use your retirement savings to support your income. 
And for many of us, it's a hard thing to get your mind about because we're taught to be frugal and to save. At the end of our life, once we have our capital there, that's there to support retirement income. So as the report said, it's a very complex system. Um, people don't understand it well. And what we need to do is to think about how we use those resources effectively in retirement. And in particular, how we look at uh, the um, wealth that's stored in our home and use that to supplement our standard of living in retirement. Indeed, indeed. It's, uh, it's a changing generation of thinking, but an important one that we all move our heads to now. Um, I think society decades ago wasn't trained to think this way. Um, and it's nice to see us all now evolving. My second question today is for Fiona. Fiona, everyone who's come along today wants to understand what a reverse mortgage is. Um, and I'm looking forward to you telling us exactly <laughs> what it is to start us off. Well, I, look, I would start really simply, Rebecca, by, by saying, look, a reverse mortgage effectively allows people who are either single or couples who own their own, their own home, you, you need to be 60 or over, but effectively it enables you to access the equity that you've built up in your home over all the years that you've been paying your mortgage and to use that equity to live well in retirement. And look, there are all sorts of different scenarios that these facilities are useful for, but a really common one uh, that we see all the time with our clients would be uh, people who are essentially living on the pension, own their own home outright. And, you know, what we see is that most people can live really well and they're very frugal and they'll live really well day to day, week to week. But it's when the big expenses hit. So, you know, the water heater blows up, the car breaks down, all of the rates and all the bills hit at once, or there's a medical emergency, then it becomes really difficult to actually live on the pension. And, you know, a, a reverse mortgage enables you to actually draw down to cover those big expenses when you need to. Um, and it saves people from having to go into credit card debt, which is, you know, obviously serious interest rate issues there. So it, it's a simple, it's actually quite a simple product, really. Yeah. I'd like to continue on with you, Fiona, if you don't mind. What do people commonly use a reverse mortgage or a household loan, as they're called by household capital, for? Well, they're actually really, really flexible products. So you can draw down from a household loan in many ways. So you can take lump sums when you need it, or you can draw an income stream if that's what's required. And we have lots of different uses for these products. So I'll just sort of run through the common things that we see. So the first one would be for home renovations. So what we know from our clients is that most people have really done a lot of research on whether or not they should downsize. And often it's a really expensive exercise, firstly. And secondly, it's often hard to actually find the right property to downsize so that you can stay in your community, stay with your friends, stay with your family and, and be where you want to be. So we do a lot of renovations. And I think we've got a slide on one client um, of ours uh, who can't quite see the, oh yeah, here we go. So a before and an after for a reno. So this is a, a client of mine, actually, Steve and Jenny. And they um, essentially love where they live. It's a beautiful spot. They decided to borrow 19% of the value of their property to improve their property so that they could live really well for the rest of their retirement where they are. Um, so this is one example. But we, are, we would do a lot um, of cosmetic renovations for people so they can be comfortable. So a lot of kitchens, a lot of bathrooms, a lot of paintwork, just to make where you are um, to be comfortable in the future. So that, that would be the first scenario. Um, the second scenario then would be that we do a lot of um, scenarios where people need to pay for medical expenses or care. So aged care being one very specific category, but medical expenses. So you know, um, even if you've got healthcare cover, which a lot of our clients actually have, there's always gaps if you've got serious medical issues. 
So we do a lot of operations and um, help for treatment. And look, I've got a really beautiful client story I can relate here. So I have this wonderful client called John and he lost his wife several years ago. He had really large issues with his teeth and um, you know, had medical cover, but it does, didn't cover the dental work that he needed. So in his scenario, that um, issue was not just about his teeth. It was about couldn't eat well, he was gaining weight, he lost mobility because of that, he wasn't comfortable in social situations. So, you know, we were able to help him fund his whole, uh, his whole set of implants, actually. And he said he well, can teeth are some of the most important elements to your health and body that they don't tell you until you get older that looking after your teeth can cause many reasons why you can't have foot surgery. Um, yeah, you know, they, they exactly. won't let you get surgery on parts of your body if your teeth aren't in good condition. Yeah. Well, that's it. And oh, but it, it also affects your social confidence and your ability mm. to actually live well. So this is like a beautiful story. I, I really love yeah. this one. And, and John, you know, after he had his full mouth done, he actually sent me this most beautiful email saying, look, I've um, now got the smile I always dreamed of. I'm walking. Yeah, right. I've lost weight. I'm comfortable. I'm about to go off on, in my, he has a, a big camper van and he was about to go off on a trip just before COVID, thank you. Magic. Um, so, you know, so that's, the medical thing's a really big one. Um, the next one would be just adding extra income. So you can draw down out of these loans and just supplement your pension or your, or your income. So we do a lot of this and it's a really good way to use these loans because you only pay interest on what you draw. And so we do a lot of this, but I'm also going to say it can help people who can't qualify for a pension. So I've got a, a beautiful lady who's a recent client of mine, and she actually um, inherited a property fr from her parents, but there was another sibling living in that property. And so effectively that made it unaccessible for her, but it also prevented her getting the pension. So this lady has been working and well into her 70s, you know, um, and so we've been able to do this income stream for her and she's so excited because now she can actually retire. She's been working in the same job for 38 years. So, you know, that's really satisfying. And look, what will happen there is eventually they'll be able to sell that property and, you know, she can pay off this loan, but she can retire. So the income stream is really great. Um, the next one, and just a couple sort of major, other major ones to mention, but refinancing existing debt. So what we do observe is that a, a lot of retirees do retire and they've still got a mortgage on foot. And that's fine. But then if you're trying to live on your retirement income stream and cover mortgage uh, payments, that becomes very difficult. And so we do a lot of refinances of normal mortgages. And what people, wow. yeah, what people don't really realise is that they're really flexible, these loans. So if people want to continue to pay down their mortgage, they can, absolutely. But you've got flexibility, you know. So if you, you the loan contract doesn't mandate you make payments. So if, if you have a month where massive expenses hit you, you can say, okay, I, I, can, I can't make a payment this month and you're at no risk of foreclosure or anything else. So we do a lot of, a lot of refinances. And look, the very, very last thing I'll mention is that we do actually and are able to help self-funded retirees. And so I have a number of clients where, you know, they've got a whole lot of assets that are supporting them and they, but they want to help their children or their grandchildren either get into, into property or pay for um, educational expenses. And these loans are a really good way of doing that because effectively you don't have to sell down your investment assets and in many of those cases you know I've got um, the scenario where the kids or the grandkids are paying that loan back so yeah that, that's just a few examples and of course uh, it, of it really humanizes it to hear it from from you that way because it's a category that 
you know, we hear about home loans all the time in the press because the young people are all doing it. But we're a generation where, where the classic walk into a bank home loan is not available to over 60s. So we're in a different world, a different category and a different problem solution. And, and knowing that, so I'm going to throw to Noel now because the, the whole concept around accessing equity in, in your home is something you talk about and the different way, I want you to come through if you don't mind, Noel, and help us understand the different ways people access equity in their homes um, to, to live their retirements and okay. take us right back up to the big picture. Every option has a good points and bad points. The first one is just sell, sell the house and downsize. But that's going to cost you at least $100,000 in changeover costs. It may, it may be much more. And you've got no guarantee that what you downsize to will be any good. So it's a punt with that. And also because you're converting an exempt asset, your house, to a non-exempt asset, cash or superannuation or whatever, you could lose all or part of the pension. So it's a good thing in some cases. And also be very careful about moving out of your neighbourhood because most people are happiest in their neighbourhood and sometimes a move to a bad neighbourhood is no good. The next move is reverse mortgage. This way you stay in your home. You don't have all the moving costs. You know exactly where you are and uh, it's a lot cheaper. Now, obviously, the interest on the loan builds up as time passes, but it's a lot less normally than what you would pay in moving costs. So you stay where you are. I think that's the best way for most people. And the last one's a bit complex. It's where you sell a portion of your home to a reversion release company. And what you do then, they buy a proportion of your house and you keep a proportion. And normally because they give you the money now, the amount that, you, that they take when you sell the home is, is a lot more than when you borrow the money or sell them a share. So I think the selling a share of your house is complex and also if property prices go crazy, you could be paying much, much more than you th ever thought you were going to. So it's complex. Oh, thank you. I think that it, the simplicity is of, of this type of solution is, is part of its elegance in, in all reality. No, and we're going to talk a lot about it. I mean, if you've got a reverse mortgage, you always know exactly what you owe. And secondly, if the family can afford to make payments, they can do it. If you suddenly win $100,000 in the lotto, you can pay part of it off. So what a I reverse mortgage does is give you flexibility and certainty. And, and you don't have the cost of downsizing. Terrific. And by the winning. same token, you're not changing to a brand new house. So, you know, it's a question of whatever works for you. Thank you, Noel. Um, the government, and, and I want to throw to Deborah now, that the government provides a different kind of reverse mortgage product as well, which, which we always like to make sure people know the whole gamut of solutions available so that they can really see the world and then understand where a product fits. The government's one is called the Government Pension Loan Scheme. Deborah, can you give us some insight into this scheme, how it works and how it differs from a normal reverse mortgage? Oh, you're on mute. Hang on, let's unmute Deborah. Hang on, Deborah. We just need Deborah. <laughs> it's the problem of the modern age being on mute. Um, <laughs> the pension loan scheme is a government provided. Um, uh, it's it's like a reverse mortgage, but provided by the government. And I guess that in some ways it it, it um, satisfies your needs to draw additional income. You can draw up to about one and a half times the normal uh, pension rate, whether you're a single or a couple, um, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, and after the last budget, you can now actually draw that amount per year as a lump sum. So that's around about 10,000 for a single retiree or 18,000 for a couple. There are no regular repayments as with a normal reverse mortgage and um, income from the scheme is not assessed under the age pension test. Uh, it also has a no negative equity pledge. So we're going to talk about that when we talk about regulation, but 
under the regulations for reverse mortgages these days, you cannot get yourself into a situation of debt. And that also applies to the um, pensioner loan scheme. It's available both to pensioners and self-funded retirees too, which is a really important point because the name of it is a little bit deceptive. Uh, when your home is sold, the government reclaims uh, what you have withdrawn plus uh, the interest on that. But it's a relatively limited amount that you can draw. And when we heard Fiona talking about the different reasons why people will take out a reverse mortgage, you can see that this doesn't always satisfy those categories because of the limitation on the amount of money. So it's a nice way of supplementing your income if you just want a small amount, but it may not satisfy something like a home renovation. Mm, it's helpful to know uh, and, and good to know all the information that's out there. Noel, now that we've got that insight into the big products that sit in this space, can you explain to us um, why people choose a reverse mortgage over the other options? Well, I think the first one is they like to stay in their own neighbourhood. That's very important to many people. And also they've heard all the, all the talk about I've, I've, I've moved to a strata title unit and all the body corporates having fights. You know, if you move, you don't know the neighbours you're going to get. So it's nice to stay at home if you're happy at home. And a reverse mortgage lets you stay at home. And you don't have the cost of moving. As far as the other one, where you sell a portion of your property to, to someone else, you're actually giving away a lot of the future growth of your property. So it's uncertain and you can't make payments on it. So I just think if you want to stay in your home, the reverse mortgage is the best solution you can have. Yeah, flexibility it's lovely to hear from you. Trans <laughs> we've got flexibility and transparency. See, if I sell a portion of my home and that portion is based on capital gain, I've got no idea what the house is going to do. At least in a reverse mortgage, every month I know precisely how much I owe. Oh, thank you. That, that, it's very helpful to understand it from your independent perspective. Yeah. Deborah, these products have in previous decades had a bad reputation, but there's been an awful lot of change here. So how are consumers protected in today's world from borrowing money that they or their estate can't afford to lend? Mm -hmm. There has been tremendous change in terms of the regulation of reverse mortgages. And prior to about 2012, these kinds of loans were regulated state by state and the consumer protection was not great. Um, and indeed, in some cases, people got into a situation of negative equity of borrowing too much against their home. It's simply not possible to do that anymore because now there is uh, uh, many forms of control, including a no negative equity pledge. And occasionally you'll come across an individual when you mention the word uh, word reverse mortgage, they will have an immediate negative reaction. And that goes back to those days when there was a bit of publicity around that stuff. But the really good news is that since about 2012, we've seen um, a tremendous uh, improvement in this regulation under the National Consumer Credit Protection Act, to be exact. And um, this provides a whole lot of um, levels of comfort for anyone moving into this kind of the loan. The most important thing is that when you take out a reverse mortgage, you have the right to continuing occupancy of your home. So you can take, stay in your own community and have that additional income. All you have to do is to meet the normal requirements of a homeowner, keep your insurance up, maintain the property, and um, you can't be forced to sell your home. Um, you also have 100% uh, exposure to any growth, any capital gain on the home. So while you're um, paying a return on the mortgage, that's offset by the fact that in most cases you're getting some capital gain on the property. So that's uh, a great benefit. And the home remains in your um, name and uh it, it is your property for life. So you get the best of both worlds. Additional income, but you stay in your community and you stay in your home. Um, just one little thing to warn people about too. Sometimes if you do a Google search on reverse mortgages, you'll end up bringing up stuff from the US. 
And I've got to say, it's it's really interesting to see how far ahead Australia has come in terms of those kinds of consumer protection. So always be wary of that and just double check that you're talking about an Australian reverse mortgage because that is really the gold standard. It certainly is. I know the categories in the UK and Australia have, have blindingly moved ahead of the rest of the world and the, the government uh, recognition of this industry, I think, is, is flagship and and frankly, they're, they're building it in to the future of how people fund their retirement and they've put the legislation in place to make sure people start to respect the category um, and know its place because I don't think the government can afford to run yeah. a retirement in the future without products like this that work well for people. That's very true, Rebecca, yes. Yeah. Um, so, look, now, Fiona, I'd like to get back to the nuts and bolts because I think people have heaps of questions in the realities of how it all works. Um, so, for me, how and when do people repay a household loan? Um, well, Rebecca, it's, it's, there's a number of ways we can do it. So, let's, I'm going to start with the voluntary repayment first, which I've covered. So, it is definitely possible for you to voluntarily repay these loans, you know. And Noel, to your point earlier, I'm seriously waiting for my first client to win the lotto, you know. <laughs> and honestly, we have a joke about this with every client I talk to. When you win the lotto, you can just pay this thing out. And, and you can, and there's no penalties, you know. If, if, if that happens and you're super lucky, you can pay these things out. And of course, you can pay them down as you go or whatever. So that's the first sort of voluntary, yep, you can voluntarily pay them. Now, if you don't voluntarily repay these loans, then effectively what happens is they sort of just drift along until one of three events, right? So the, the very first one would be if you ever just decide to sell your property and move somewhere else. So you make, and a few clients are doing that at the moment because property prices have whoop, gone through the roof. Um, you know, you sell your property, you basically just pay this loan out on um, settlement of the contract. So that's just sort of as per a standard mortgage. Uh, the second scenario would be, and it's always the last person. So if you both live your life out in the property that you're in and you've got this um, guaranteed occupancy, which Deb talked about, then effectively what happens is when the last person departs the planet, so to speak, um, then your beneficiaries would have a year to repay the loan. And that's actually a really good thing that clients like because it, it provides time to work out what to do. So when someone's grieving and beneficiaries are grieving, they don't have to run around madly for seller property. You know, they could can take their time, figure out what they're going to do. They can retain the property if they want to and just pay this loan out with another mortgage or they could sell the property when they're ready, repay the repay the loan. So there's a year for beneficiaries after the last person uh, leaves. And then the, the very final and only other trigger to repayment of the loan is when, again, it's always the last person. So if the last person on the title goes into an aged care facility, um, which no one seems to want to do, but you know, if, it, if that ever ha ha has to happen, then you have five years to repay the loan. And the rationale there is, well, some people will obviously sell their property to go into aged care if they need the funds to do that. But um, the way that the pension system works at the moment is that your house, after you go, the last person goes into aged care at the moment, you have two years before your house is assessed for the asset test. And so sometimes people really love to retain their property if they can. So, yep. So they're the only triggers when it's got to be repaid. Otherwise, it's really up to the individual, you know, how they manage it. Yeah, wow. Uh, that, I mean, it, it's so interesting to hear how the function of the product works. If you only likely touch that you'll need to repay your household loan when you sell your home. But how does this impact your loan and your home as well? Yeah, well... Look, this has been talked about a little bit already, and I think we've got a slide um, to go through an example here. But effectively, the main thing to remember is that these are simple loans. So you're only ever going to owe whatever you've borrowed plus whatever interest has accumulated. Okay, so, the, so lenders of, for these sorts of facilities would never have any ownership in your property. 
So I've got an example here and we would do an individual example for every single client. So using very conservative numbers so they can see kind of what this looks like. And we do the worst case scenario. So in this scenario, we've got Jack and Sandra who are 67 and they own a property worth 750,000. So if you can see they're, you know, they're borrowing $75,000 to start with. And you can see over time what happens. So with this illustration, we're projecting the property growing at an average of 3% per annum over the next 15 years. Um, and you know, look, we're showing it as a, a gradual growth. And of course, property moves around, but you would expect and hope that over 15 years, a 3% growth rate is, is reasonably conservative. And what you can see there is the pink, and, and this is assuming that this, these particular clients never actually make any payments on the loan, okay? So um, you can see there in five years time, the loan, which is the little pink bit, has grown to $96,000. Um, and the property has grown as well to $869,000 if, if it grows at 3%. So if they were to sell in five years, they're left with $773,000. And then we project all the way out to 15 years when you can see at, at that sort of assumption, you know, the loan has grown to 157,000, presuming they pay nothing. Um, and the property is at 1.168 million. So if they sold in 15 years, they're left with a million and eleven thousand dollars one twenty seven. So look, this is just an example to say, look, you you you've got to um, understand how the, how these loans work. You've got to put it in perspective with the, the the growth that you expect on your property, and you've got to feel comfortable, you know, at any point in that timeline that there's still enough equity there for you or, and your beneficiaries, depending on what it is that you're wanting to do. Yeah, look, and, and look, in a in a very relaxed way, I'd love to throw to Noel on, on this point and just get, get everybody discussing this on the panel, because I think this scenario and the way you've, you've done it actually comes into where a financial planner gets involved in your estate planning and they do the projections for you. And, and Noel, you would have seen this along the way. Tell us a bit of a story about what you've seen when people do their plans. Well, I think, the, I think the whole thing is if you decide to move, where are you going to go? So you start to look and you look and you look. And it's always hard to find exactly what you want that <clears throat> fits your criteria. Having found what you want, you've got to sell yours. And then you could be caught between houses. So you're forced to a the big search, all the costs of moving and the, and the challenge of selling your house as well. And you may, you may sell it too cheaply. Uh, the thing about a reverse mortgage, it's such a simple transaction. You don't do anything. You just stay in your own house and enjoy it. There's no costs, no moving expenses. There's no hassle of moving. The, there's no chance of when you move, the neighbours are horrible. It's just such a simple way to do it. Look, I, I love the fact, and I in my job, I hear all the time, nobody ever wants to end up in residential aged care in yeah. this in this day and age right we all want to stay in our homes until yeah. um the end comes or, or move to a retirement village if that's our choice to to live in a place where there's support and and care um but the reality becomes they're the choices people make and it's beautiful to see aging in place become supported financially not just functionally because in order to buy all the things you need for your home um, to age in place and, and we all know modern houses have high lipped bathtubs and things that you need to remove from the house over the years as you start to get the reality you know I've, I've seen it even on cruise ships in my job as well you've got to know about those things as you get a little bit older and how how your leg doesn't go up to your waist anymore and all that joy unless you're doing your yoga every day um, <laughs> and and so you modify your house and so you stay there and you can stay there uh, until also, your 80s. But also, if you go to a retirement village, most of them you can't take a reverse mortgage on. No. So no. most retirement village, the way the title is structured, you just can't take a reverse mortgage. Mm. Yeah. So it's, a, it's actually, a that hasn't been talked about well enough. Sorry. Yeah. I, I would, sorry, just on that point, Noel, I'm really glad you raised that because we do get a lot of calls from people that are in over 55 or retirement villages. And it's, it's really difficult for us to help 
those people because we we can't take a proper collateral over the property. I, I mean, I have um, certainly had a couple of clients where they're in a retirement village, but they're in an actual normal strata arrangement. And if that's the case, which is very unusual, then we can help. But um, yeah, that, that's tricky otherwise. I think it's but good think for people that would have to been understand. An older style too. I think that would have been an older style village, I think. Yeah, yeah. Not There's not too many of them around. <laughs> mm. Well, I think it's good for people to understand it at this point, at the earliest point they can in their retirement income planning uh, mm. and the role it can play, because I think it's been something that hasn't been talked about enough, which I'm pleased to be able to. My next actual organised question is for Fiona and I want to ask very directly because today is about you know complete unveiling of this category um there's a question that comes up all the time that we love to myth bust on can a consumer lose their home as a result of a reverse mortgage yeah um and look I think Deb has covered this already very well talking about the regulation so it would be true to say that before these regulations came in, in um, 2012, there were some ordinary products out there and, and people could get themselves into difficulty. Um, now it's virtually impossible for so many reasons. I mean, the first, you know, Deb's talked about guaranteed lifetime occupancy and the no negative uh, equity guarantee, which are protections that consumers have with these loans. But I'd add a couple of more sort of additional points. The first one being that you're actually restricted in the amount that you can borrow. And so, you know, it starts at 15% when you're 60 and it goes up a percentage point each year, the older you get. So, you know, by the time you get to 80, you can borrow maximum sort of 35% of the value of your property. So the reality is that you are restricted in the amount you can borrow. You can't borrow, you know, a huge amount of money such that you could really get yourself into difficulty. So that, that would be, that's a really important point. And we've got a calculator on our website that helps people, you know, see what they're eligible for um, within the reg regulations. Uh, and the, the other point that I'd make is that we are bound as lenders in this category to really uh, responsible lending criteria. And what that effectively means is that we can't just sort of blanket lend to anyone, we, we've got to understand your personal situation. And, you know, we have to be able to stay and state in our lending criteria that what you're doing within this fits the purpose and the need and doesn't leave you bereft when you're older. And so I think there's just so many protections with these products that the guaranteed lifetime occupancy is a really big one. And that effectively means that these loans are almost impossible to foreclose on. Um, as long as you, as Deb said, pay your rates, keep your home maintained, um, make sure it's insured, then you know, you, you've, got, you've got this guaranteed lifetime occupancy uh, protection. Uh, it's great to understand it. I, I think that transparency you're able to provide on this is, is sensational, thank you. Um, Noel, I've got some, some last questions for you today before we go into our Q&As. Now, if you're out there in the community before I start with Noel and you have a question for our panel, um, I'd like you to, to just pop it in the Q&A here on the screen at the bottom. Um, our team are in there and they're pulling those out and passing them through to me live. So we'll be able to ask questions of our panel live and get them to answer your questions today. Um, and if you are on Facebook, our team is also manning the Facebook live stream as well. So please pop them in and we will do our best to cover all your questions today. So Noel, you really are a believer that a reverse mortgage or a household loan can play a key part in funding retirement. I'd, I'd love you to come back into this question and, and tell us why. Well, I think we've sort of covered it. A, it means you can stay in your own house. Second, or you don't have the cost of moving. You've got no impact on your age pension. And uh, it's a transparent product and it's mm. flexible. And I think all those things give it a great big tick. Thank you so much for such a um, complex and sometimes confusing industry. You guys have made it so very clear and simple to understand. Um, so far, thank you. We've covered all the big and common questions that, that we uh, dug out of our community about 
uh, that people ask about a household loan. Um, but we've received some more already. So while we've been talking, the, the little Q&A box has filled up and I've got some good ones to start us on. Um, one thing I do like to make sure is to put our little disclaimer on the screen because we always need to make sure everybody knows the, uh, the way it all works when we give Q&A. Um, I want to remind you that we can, as a panel, only provide general information that isn't personalised to your specific situation. So just remember that nothing we say here today should take the place of independent financial advice or legal advice. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to start um, some of the, the fun questions that have been submitted. Noel, can a reverse mortgage um, affect my pension? This uh, question has been asked by Jenny in our community today. Well, it would it would normally wouldn't affect your pension. The only way I could see it would be if you borrow a sum of money and invested it, and it would make no sense at all to borrow money to invest anyway. So in normal cases, there should be no effect on your pension. Okay, I've got one, and, and this one could... Um, could go to any of you really um, and it's one that we haven't answered yet today um, um, from Robert what is the perfect age to take out a reverse mortgage can I ask well I can say briefly the older the better okay there's less compounding time but by the same token you use it or lose it so don't wait too long <laughs> yeah well I guess uh, 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 I I think I would agree, I would endorse that entirely. I, I think, you know, for me, um, you know, if you're in your 70s, it's a good time. I, I think you want to be able to use your money while you're fit and vital and well and enjoy yourself. But at the same time, you definitely don't want to go overboard and burden yourself too early, you know, for the future. If you've got 30 years ahead of you in retirement, you want to be more cautious. If you've got less time left in your retirement you can you can afford to do a bit more but it's horses for courses and it'll depend on the personal situation yeah. also i strike people that they're on their own they're single and they don't have dependents they say well i say well spend your house you know, yeah. you may as well oh no the clients that i have in that in that situation they're the biggest question is when is the time that i want to run out of my money i want to have my all my money used I want to live my life well, and that's and right. I and I don't have to worry about anyone. I mean, that's right. it, it, that it's a perfect scenario for that. Perfect. Can I ask Noel? You're you're an, a former independent financial planner. How do you answer that question? Uh, when do I run out of money? <laughs> what age do I aim for? <laughs> well, well, the whole thing is the way the system works. There are so many variables. The first thing, your health. If you've got family, if they put their hand out. But also, as your money reduces, the age pension goes up. So it's like a governing system. And as your, asset, as your assets drop, age pension goes up. So you won't run out of money. But also, as people get older, they get more prudent. You, you don't spend nearly as much when you're 80 as you do when you're 60. You don't need to. Yeah, no, it's great feedback. Um, my next question is from Lily. Uh, isn't it more prudent to keep my existing mortgage at a very low bank rate than a high interest reverse mortgage rate? I stress about the growth rate of the balance of a reverse mortgage. Hmm. I suspect I start this with Noel. I thought Fiona for that one, I think. Fiona? Okay, Fiona. <clears throat> yeah, and, and look, you've really got to look at this. So obviously the interest rate is going to be a little bit higher with a reverse mortgage. And the reason that it is is because we've got all of these protections to manage and it's a much more expensive uh, facility to operate. So, so you do have to weigh up your current interest rate versus the flexibility. So we, we, I have, would have detailed conversations with clients about this. And it, it's, a, it's a question of what is your, your, your situation and what's more important. Now, if you really need the flexibility um, and the ability, you've you still got the ability to pay these down. So that's the important thing to know. And you can manage that balance online. You can see what's happening. You can choose to pay it down. So you can manage the compounding effect. Um, but yes, I would say you do have to think about the interest rate and you have to think about your other needs and what it is that you're... So, so if your existing mortgage is really crippling you in terms of being able to live well, um, then I think there's a really valid uh, argument for looking at, looking at this sort of a facility. 
Okay. My, I have two questions from our next viewer. Uh, the first one is actually for Deborah. Why do reverse mortgages cost more than a standard home loan? They picked you out, Deborah. I'm not sure why. Yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, Fiona's uh, partly addressed that. And that is that um, un under the regulations, there is um, a higher, what they call a capital requirement on the part of any lender. But also, if you think about it, Normally, when you have a mortgage, someone is repaying regularly along the way. So you haven't got, you've got a return on the money that you're lending. Usually with a reverse mortgage, there's no repayment until the home is sold. So you've got to sit on that for quite a long period of time as a lender. The other thing is you don't know how long that loan is going to last. There's no determined period. So if you think about a regular mortgage, determined period of time, regular repayments, it's a very different product um, when you've got a reverse mortgage. So for lenders, it is a lot more expensive to fund. So you will find that the interest rate is higher. But I think Fiona gave a great example before of how much the interest rate is, how much the growth in property is. That's the kind of thing that you really need to talk to the lender about. They're required to give you all sorts of scenarios so you can weigh up um, uh, exactly what the impact of that higher interest rate is going to be, bearing in mind that you will probably get property growth along the way. And uh, in, the, in the Retirement Income Review, we give some examples of what happens when you're repaying at a higher interest rate, but also the value of your home is going up quite significantly over that time, which is the scenario we're used to. So the net cost is not as high as you might think. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Barbara as well, and this one's for Fiona. Can I get a reverse mortgage on an investment property and use the funds to purchase a new family home? Uh, the answer to that question would be yes. Um, and, and again, that's not well understood, that we actually do provide our household loan to help people get into a new property. So you can use it like you would a normal mortgage if you're going to purchase a new property. And we also can loan against investment property. So, yeah, wow. yeah. Thank you. Um, and then the next one is for Fiona as well from Shelley. Can you borrow twice? If you take a small amount the first time, can you come back for more? Uh, yep, yeah, you can. Um, so effectively what we would do in our discussions with clients is really talk about what you think you need in the next little while, few years, or what, what seems reasonable. And we suggest people apply for, for, the, for the amount that they think they're really going to need and maybe with a little bit of a, an extra contingency buffer there. Um, as long as you're within the regulatory amount, so given that your home's gonna grow, you can borrow a little bit more the older you get. If you need to come back for some additional money, we can do a loan variation and it would, it would just make, you just have to make sure that we've got we've got some room to move within those sort of boundaries that we're confined by. But yes. Yeah, okay. More questions are rolling in. Oh no, yes, please. Uh, that person who wanted to borrow against the uh, against the investment property to, to buy a new one, I'll bet they're after a tax deduction for the interest. Uh -huh. And you and you can't get one for the interest. I mean, the interest <laughs> the interest depends on the purpose of the of the loan not the property mortgaged. So yes, you can borrow against the investment property to fund your own residence, but the interest is not deductible. Okay, that's yeah. very good insight. Thank you. I'm a misconception that one, yeah, yeah. Absolutely right, yeah. yeah. Nice. Uh, more questions are jumping in every, every, every time I look up. So um, my next question is from Cheryl and it's for Fiona. Who is responsible for having your home valued in order to determine the amount you can borrow? And is it possible to top up the loan as your equity continues to build? Yeah. So um, we're required to have an independent valuer value the property, just like would be the case with any sort of mortgage. So we use a couple of very large um, independent valuation firms. So what you can expect there is that they're going to be reasonably conservative. So they're not going to come in at a real estate, um, you know, if you get your, real, your, your local real estate agent in to give you a valuation, that's usually going to be pretty optimistic. So 
Um, but yeah, that part of the process, it's built into the, um, the establishment fee and the loan. The client, it's organised by the lender. So it's quite a straightforward exercise. And um, in terms of the top up, yep, that would go to my previous answer. It is possible to top up as long as you're within the limits of what's allowable based on your age and the value of your property. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, Fiona, I have another one for you. This one's from Gregory. Um, I have a small mortgage with an open drawdown option for the next 25 years. If I take a reverse mortgage, do I have to pay it out or can I maintain both? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And yes, you would have to pay it out because we do need to hold the first mortgage over the property. So again, um, I have a lot of clients where they've got existing lines of credit. They've kept open for years and years and years just in case. Um, it, it's a question of looking at the different facilities. I, I think, you know, I've had recent clients where they've had lines of credit for a long period of time and the bank's getting, depending on how old you are, you know, they won't allow you necessarily to keep your line of credit open forever. Um, yeah, and, and then if you do draw down on it, there'll be a limited term of repayment depending on your age, which can mean that your repayments can be high. So they're the sorts of things to look at when you've got a line of credit facility. But yes, you, you obviously would never close an existing line of credit facility until you had another facility completely approved and available. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, hang on, my next question is from David. Should I take legal advice before I take out a household loan? And who do I get that financial advice from? Or legal, legal or financial advice, I think, would be David's question there. And who should he get that from? Okay. Yeah, I'll take it away. I think above all, you, above all, you need to involve the family. Because what you're really doing is spending the kids' money. So it's very important they know what's going on. Possibly they, they may be able to, to contribute to some of the repayments. Uh, and certainly you need to understand exactly what it, what's involved. At least in a reverse mortgage, it's fairly simple. Uh, in other cases, it's not so simple. So you need legal advice, yes, but also you need common sense advice as to how the family feel about it. Very and is it legal or financial planner advice, can I ask? Uh, financial planners don't do this. Okay. I don't think. So, yeah, and, and I would just sort of endorse that. Uh, uh, for every client that we have, it is required that the client has legal advice at the end of the process. Just to, it, all it is, is to have a lawyer review the contract for you. And that's just a protection that's really good to have. Um, so, yes, we, we would require, and I think every provider requires that clients do have um, a lawyer just cite the contract. They don't have to do any work per se, but they do, they do need to advise you on the contract. Oh, that's wonderful, thank you. Um, I, my next question is from Lindsay. What is the interest rate for a household loan and how does interest get apportioned to the loan? Well, obviously the interest rate is going to differ depending on the provider. So in our case for household capital, our interest rate is 4.95%. And the way that interest works is that it's calculated daily and applied monthly. And so in any projection that we provide um, to a client, it will, that, that's, the, that's what it will project, yeah. Okay. Um, another one from, uh, this one's from Sue. Uh, I have a terminal illness. Can I still take out a household loan to make my remaining years more comfortable? I'm not sure who's best to answer this. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I'll jump in and say that yes, absolutely. And it's very sad to say we do have a lot of people who have terminal illnesses. Um, and really, it's an, it's expensive, and you want to have a, the best life you can while you while you can. So yeah, absolutely. Help with medical expenses and everything else. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah, great. And, and actually, um, uh, if I could, just one little thing, something that does recur often with people who are very ill um, is that they need reliable transport. <laughs> but that people 
have very, very old cars sometimes that have been going for 30 years. And if you've got to get to a medical appointment, if you're very ill, it's often you need a, a reliable vehicle. Yeah, okay. Bit of a side um, point. <laughs> yeah. Another question has just popped in uh, at the last minute. I've got just two questions to go. This one's from Donna. Do you have to be retired to access this product? And I don't think we've asked about the age, have we? So maybe I'll just Why would you need to be that. retired? You might have a short, you might be working with a low paid job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. That's good to yeah. know. I think. Yeah, yeah. You don't. You definitely don't have to be retired. Yeah. I've there's with heaps of people we deal with who still work, and um, or they're planning their exit from work. You know, yeah. it's sort of a gradual thing. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I have another question, and I can see another one coming. They're just flowing in. Um, my mum is likely to need to move into aged care soon, and she doesn't want to sell her home. How could a household loan help fund the cost of aged care? Yeah, well, Noel, in terms of the advice for aged care, obviously finance, financial advice is needed there because it's really complicated, if possible, a specialist in aged care. But in terms of the funding part, yes. Um, so these loans can, and household loans can help fund um, either a RAD, so a a lump sum deposit to an aged care facility, or um, in many cases, depending on the advice from the, the advisor involved, um, we could fund daily care fees. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And usually um, in, in that scenario, usually we're dealing with, the, usually it's the children who are the enduring power of attorney for the person that's going into care. Anything to add, guys? Well, just one thing that in our RID, the proceeds go to the estate of the person who died when the person dies. So if it's a late relationship, you might, you might not want the new partner. You, you might not want that money to go to her estate. You'd rather not go to your kids. And it's a very complex, specialised area, aged care. Yeah, it absolutely is. Mm. It really is. Mm. Um, yeah, it's really important to have specialist advice in that area. Yeah. Yeah, great. And one last question as we've just hit one full hour talking together today. Um, my mum is likely, oh, sorry, I've missed it. Uh, I've got an extra one. Uh, and this one's from Lily again. Can I get a reverse mortgage on my apartment as opposed to a house? Uh, is yes. this one for you, Fiona? Yes? Yes, yeah, you can. And look, in most apartment scenarios, it'll be the, exactly the same eligibility as if you're in a house. Um, the only um, proviso on that is if you were living in a very, very high density apartment area, you could still get it. You could still get one of these loans, but potentially your valuation might be reduced slightly. Yeah, okay. I've got one more tricky question that's just been thrown into the chat room before I wrap up. Um, from John, we were thinking of selling the house to move into a unit closer to the beach in the same area, but we are looking at bridging loan, uh, a bridging loan to buy the unit first, then sell the house and pay all of except for a hundred thousand dollars debt. Pitfalls, please. Well, <laughs> Don't you love these curly ones? <laughs> high risk, because what if you can't sell the existing house? You're stuck yeah. with both and a loan. You know. Uh, uh, I think it's done. Ah, thank you very much. Um, now, as we, I'm really sorry to have to finish our masterclass now, everybody. Um, but before I do, I'm just going to throw to each of our speakers to give us a little bit of closing out of today's conversation. Noel, any last messages for our community? Well, I think what it does is lets you use your capital up. You know, you use it or lose it. Uh, I think it's a great idea. Enjoy your life. That's great. Deborah, <laughs> any last messages? Well, I think for um, older Australians with little super um, and maybe um, an existing mortgage, it makes much better sense to convert your existing mortgage to a reverse mortgage so you keep your super to supplement your retirement income. Yeah, wonderful. And Fiona, last messages from you. Um, yeah, look, I would just say that if anything that we've spoken about today rings a bell or you think it might be 
um, relevant for you, then you can investigate, you know. Uh, so you could go on our website, which is householdcapital.com.au, do a little calc, see if you're eligible. You know, we're um, an organisation that just likes to have personal chats and, and there's no requirement to proceed with anything. You can come in and have a discussion, see if it works, get all the information you need, go away and, and give it some thought. And uh, that's what I'd suggest if, if, if you think it's, it's going to be of any value. And thank you, Fiona, for that. I really do encourage you to try out the calculator. I think it's a, a really sort of easy to use tool that we've all had to go out in our office to run out the scenarios and understand how it all works. So please, um, please get in there and have a look. I'm really sorry to have to finish up now, but this is all we have time for today, folks, in, in the fond words of the Looney Tunes. Uh, if you have any other questions about using your home equity or have any queries on financial planning for retirement, please send us an email to money at starts at 60.com and a specialist member of our team will come back to you as soon as possible or we can refer you on to household capital pretty easily as well. Um, also in the next few days, we're going to put a video recording of this masterclass along with the slides presented today um, together. And we're going to share them with all of the registrants via email so that you can rewatch this event at your convenience and soak in all that useful information. We'll also be posting the recording on Starts at 60. So if your friends or family would like to learn more about this important topic, they can do so for free at starts at 60.com and you can share it on to them as well if you think it would interest them. In the meantime, I really want to thank our exceptional panel. You all did an amazing job of making some pretty complex topics um, a bit easier to understand. And I know I've seen thank you messages just firing through the chat room to you all um, with them all saying how helpful you've been in really unveiling an industry that, that I think has some misperceptions. So, and a huge thank you to Household Capital. Um, we love having you as a sponsor. And you can find out more about Household Capital at householdcapital.com.au on their website. Um, and you can see that on the screen in front of you and it will be linked on the slides and on the screens in all the chat rooms. We hope to see you again really soon for another Starts at 60 Masterclass. And in the meantime, say happy, healthy and sassy everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.